Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm covering part three of Burns. If you haven't done so already, guys, I know I just started this video, but you know you're gonna like the video. Like this video, um, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, press that red notification button so that you'll be notified every time a new video is released. Don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com, and you guys can catch me on my other social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Now, if you haven't seen part one or part two, I do suggest you watch those first because it'll make part three make more sense. Okay. So anyhow, part three burns. This is where we stop. We're right here under a fluid resuscitation of the burn patient. So look what it says. It says that we're going to initiate and maintain at least one large bore IV. Remember guys, I told you that since the first video, when it comes to burns, dehydration is a big problem. Remember dehydration, infection, um, in dehydration, infection, what's our third problem in burns? Dehydration, infection, pain, <laughs> pain. So anyway, dehydration is a very big problem. Remember all of the fluid that's supposed to be in the vascular space, it shifts, right? So we're going to be giving this patient fluids fast and hard. Therefore, look, large bore IV, at least one, usually they get two. Look at what it says. You're going to administer half of the total 24 hour prescribed volume within the first eight hours post burn. And the remaining, the remaining you're gonna give over that next 16 hours. Look what it says, we're gonna monitor the blood uh, vital signs at least hourly. You're gonna be checking that blood pressure, pulse, um, uh, respiration, breath sounds. Remember, one of those signs and symptoms of shock of us knowing that those organs are shutting down. What do we see happen to the heart rate? Heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes down. So we're looking at this, we're monitoring this patient very closely because when they've had a burn, they're at risk for going into shock. So we're going to be doing the vital signs at least every what? Hour, okay? Um, assess your output at least hourly. Remember, when that patient goes into shock, the first thing to shut down is going to be the kidneys. So we would see the urine output go down and the BUN and creatinine go up. So we're going to pay attention to the urine output because as that patient starts to get rehydrated, as they start to get better, we'll see the urine output increase. Okay, so we're going to keep a close eye on the urine output. We're going to look at the specific gravity. We're going to look at the color. We want to make sure there's no protein in the urine. Is there ever supposed to be protein in the urine? No. Whenever you see protein in the urine, we know the kidneys are in trouble. So we're going to be paying attention to the protein as well, because as that patient starts to heal and get better, the protein in the urine will what decrease. We're going to assess for fluid overload. We don't want to overcorrect the problem. So yeah, we're giving this patient lots of fluids, but we don't want to give them too much fluids where we throw them into fluid overload, where we're seeing um, distended jugular veins, where we're he uh, hearing crackles in the lungs. Are you ever supposed to hear crackles in the lungs? All those signs and symptoms of fluid overload, we're going to watch out for. Okay, so this is a very important uh, chart for burns, make sure you guys take a look at it and you understand it, press pause if necessary. Let me make this bigger for you. Let's see if the sliding's better, there we go. Look at what it says here. And NCLEX absolutely expects you guys to know this and understand this. Look what it says. It says urine output is the most common and most sensitive non-invasive assessment parameter for cardiac output and tissue perfusion. Why? Because we know once those tissues are not being perfused, perfused, that cardiac output is not sufficient for perfusion. What's the first thing to shut down on us? The kidneys. When those kidneys start to shut down, urine output goes what? Down. So absolutely, urine output is the most sensitive parameter we have for that patient's perfusion. Absolutely. NCLEX expects you to know this, guys. Look at what else it says. It says, regardless of the total amount of fluid calculated as needed for the patient, the amount of fluid given depends on how much IV fluid per hour is needed to maintain the urine output of 0.5 milliliters per kilogram, which is about what? 30 mLs per hour. 
Remember guys, 30 mLs per hour, that is the minimum amount the patient should be urinating. So yes, we do have certain guidelines, but at the end of the day, we're going to give them the amount of fluids they need for us to get at least that 30 mLs per hour out of the patient. Very important for you guys to know. Managing pain. Why did I highlight that? Because I told you when it comes to burns, you are concerned about pain. Remember, pain never killed anyone except for certain situations such as burns. That pain can be so horrendous, so excruciating that it can affect the patient's physiological integrity, right? What is another situation that we're going to treat burn as a priority? Stones, gallbladder stones, kidney stones. Um, what else? Sickle cell. Sickle cell crisis, pain is the priority. What other situation? Um, cancer patients who are getting chemo. These type of situations, pain is a priority, okay? So pain absolutely is a priority for um, burns. And this patient, when I say pain, they're not getting NSAIDs. They're not getting Motrin or acetaminophen. They're getting opioids, okay? That that pain is very intense and we need something that's going to cover that pain. Um, and when it comes to the burn patient, usually they're going to have a PCA so um, they can have some type of control within parameters, right? Some type of control over um, that medication administration. So let's take a look at interventions down here. It says the priority nursing actions include continually continually assessing the patient's pain level, using appropriate pain reducing strategies and preventing complications. Pain is a priority when it comes to burns. Non-surgical management. Drug therapy for pain usually requires what? Does that say NSAIDs? No, it says what? Opioid opioid analgesics, such as your morphine, such as your dilated. okay? Very important, guys. When it comes to burns, we're bringing out the big guns. Let's keep going. Drug alert. Give opioid drugs for pain only. What did I tell you about only? Whenever you guys are studying, you see those words only, always, never, avoid, should, priority pay special attention. Give opioid drugs for pain only by IV route during resuscitation phase to prevent delayed rapid absorption leading to lethal blood levels. Very important. Let's keep going. Environmental changes such as providing a quiet environment. You're not going to have that patient next to the nurse's station where the phones are ringing, the phones are ringing, the nurses are getting report, the healthcare providers are giving orders, the family's acting a fool. No, you're gonna have that patient at the end of the hall where it's quiet, you want it quiet, you're gonna have um, dim lighting. You don't want lots of noise, too much stimulation. So environmental changes such as providing a quiet environment using non-painful tactile stimulation and increasing the patient's control can increase comfort. What do they mean by increasing the patient's control? PCA. A burn patient, they're going to get a PCA pump, okay? Let's keep going. Increasing sleep or rest time in a quiet environment, which means we're going to have them at the end of the hall, helps reduce adverse effects of sleep deprivation, replenishes hormone stores, helps prevent critical care unit psychosis, and it restores the diurnal effects of endorphins. So it's very important, guys, that this patient gets the rest. Remember, they're in a lot of pain as it is. So that is enough for them not to get rested. You know what happens. You don't get enough rest. You start to what? Lose your mind, psychosis. You are out of touch with reality. So that patient is going to have to get good pain control. We're going to give them PCA. And we're going to make sure they're in a nice, quiet environment, very dimly lit area to promote rest. Help the patient change positions every two hours to reduce pressure on any specific area because we don't want them to get pressure ulcers, okay? We want to improve circulation to painful areas and ease the pain. To reduce anxiety and increase feelings of confidence and independence, patient-controlled analgesia also reduces the uh, pain. That patient is going to get a PCA. How many times have I said this in this video? Many times. I promise you're going to need to know it. Preventing acute respiratory distress syndrome. 
The patient with a burn injury is expected to not experience any acute respiratory distress, have ABGs within the normal limits, and maintain normal lung compliance. Okay, those are our goals for uh, this type of patient. Let's take a look at the nursing alert over here. It says, document and immediately, immediately report any signs of respiratory distress or change in respiratory patterns to the burn team and respiratory therapist. Looks like the lighting's down. Let's try this. There we go. Use aseptic technique in caring for wounds and during invasive monitoring to prevent infection. This is very important, guys. Remember, your first line of defense against uh, microorganisms and pathogens is your skin. A patient who's had a burn, that skin integrity is what? Decreased. So it's very important, anything you're doing for that patient, including those wound care, you're going to be using aseptic technique because they're already at high risk for burns. Remember, any burn patient, pain, dehydration, and infection, those are our three biggest concerns. So we want to make sure we're not the ones introducing pathogens and microorganisms into that patient's body to cause an infection. Non-surgical management. Restoring Skin tissue integrity, whether by natural healing or grafting, it starts with the removal of eschar and other cellular debris from the burn wound. You see that word eschar? That's a dead tissue. New healthy tissue can't grow in the presence of that dead tissue, okay? That's something you guys need to know. This removal, this, excuse me, removal is called debridement, getting rid of that dead tissue. Priority. Nursing interventions include assessing the wound, providing wound care, and preventing infection and other complications. Expected outcomes. The patient's expected to remain free from infection and not develop sepsis. What is sepsis? Sepsis is when that infection is now in your bloodstream. So now it's all over your body. So you can have an infection in, that's localized. It's on the right arm or the right leg or the, the left elbow. But once it's septic, it's all over your body because it's now in the bloodstream and we need to prevent that from happening. Indicators that the patient has only mild or none of these manifestations, foul smelling discharge, fever, blood culture colonization, wound site colonization, WBC elevation. All of these are signs and symptoms of infection, guys. The discharge, having a foul odor, infection. You see that temperature going up, you better suspect infection. Blood culture colonization, you're seeing those pathogens uh, 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 clump together. Those pathogens are present. Infection, wound site colonization, infection, and of course, WBC elevation. WBC is supposed to be 5 to 10. You see it creeping up, you better be thinking infection. The start here, use of asepsis requires all healthcare personnel to wear gloves during all contact with open wounds. And you guys know this because if it's wet, you're putting on gloves, period. If it's wet, saliva, mucus, urine, feces, blood, any type of discharge, if it's wet, you're putting on gloves, right? These burn patient, you want to make sure you're not the one bringing them an infection. So you are going to be wearing gloves. Everyone's wearing gloves with these, type, with, with these types of patients. Regardless of sterility, change gloves when handling wounds on different areas of the body and between handling old and new wounds. Why? You want to avoid cross-contamination. Because the patient may have many wounds on their body, so they may have an infected wound that was on the left arm, but the wound on the right lower extremity was not infected until you transferred that infection, okay? So we want to avoid cross-contamination. So when you're going from one wound to another, even though it's on the same patient, you're going to change gloves. What do you do between changing gloves? Wash our hands. 
The equipment on burn units is not shared among patients. Disposable items such as pillows, dishes are used as much as possible. Assign any equipment used in daily routine care, such as the blood pressure cuffs or the stethoscopes, to each patient for the duration of their stay. Daily cleaning of the equipment and general housekeeping are essential, priority, very important for infection control. All other equipment must be cleaned after use on one patient and before it's used on another patient. Some burn units do not per permit patients to eat raw food such as salads, fruit, pepper. Why? They want to reduce exposure to microorganisms because sometimes they're what? Tiny little bugs. Rugs, upholstered articles harbor organisms and their use is restricted. Remember, these type of patients, the burn patients, are at increased risk for infection. Visitors, and you see I put a star next to it, guys. Visitors are restricted when the patient is immunosuppressed. So people who are sick, children, other patients should not come in contact with the burn patient. Again, just because they're a burn patient, that already places them at risk for infection. Early detection involves careful monitoring of the burn wounds at each dressing change. Guys, so you're not going to change the patient's dressing just to change the dressing. You need to be looking at that wound. How has it changed? Is it getting better or is it getting worse? Are you seeing signs and symptoms of infection? Examine all wounds for these manifestations of infection. A pervasive odor. Color changes, focal, dark, red, brown, discoloration of the ISCAR, change in the texture, purulent uh, drainage, exudate, sloth grass, redness of the wound edges, extending to non-burned skin. Those are signs and symptoms that you need to be aware of. Common examples of drug therapy, and there are lots of examples here, guys, but I just, I'm going to go over the one that's seen most often for testing purposes, but go ahead and just press pause and take a look at all of these. Um, but our silvadine, okay? Look at the interventions. Look at what it says. Watch for allergic reaction causing a droop in WBC count. Do not use if reaction to sulfonamide has occurred. Use on deep partial thickness or full thickness wounds, and you're going to monitor for wound infection. That is on NCLEX, especially that part, um, the drop in WBC. You're going to watch for the allergic reaction that causes a drop in that WBC. NCLEX expects you to know that. And I've seen lots of time where they ask you about, um, they'll give you a situation about a patient has a burn, you're about to do a um, drug therapy, and you would... Um, one of the information that they give you on the patient's history is that they have a allergy to sulfonamide. Are you still going to put that ointment or cream on the patient? Or are you going to withhold that medication and call the doctor? Are you going to withhold that medication and call the healthcare provider, whether it's a physician, nurse practitioner, PA, whoever, okay? Minimizing weight loss. The patient's expected to maintain adequate nutrient intake for meeting the body's calorie needs. Whenever the body is stressed, the body has to fight off that stress. In this, what we're talking about, burn, so it's a, um, this is stress to the body. The body needs energy, and it gets the energy from calories, okay? So we need this patient to um, maintain caloric intake. So let's take a look at what it says, guys. Indicators include that the patient should have mild or no deviations from the normal ranges for weight, height ratio, food intake, their H and H, serum albumin and pre-albumin. By the way, guys, don't forget albumin. That's the protein portion of the blood, right? And I talked to you about this in video one and two, the importance of protein, especially when it comes to burns, but something else, um, I don't remember if I mentioned it, but I'll mention it now, protein is important for wound healing, okay? And also blood glucose. So under interventions, you better get a registered dietitian on the case. As the nurse, are you allowed to order the um, registered dietitian? No, but it's your responsibility to call the healthcare provider and ask for a um, registered dietitian consult and get them on the case, okay?
So we want the patient to be on a high calorie diet because remember, we need, the patient's going to need those calories for the energy to fight off this stress, this infection, this burn that they're experiencing, and they need high protein. Remember, the protein's good for what? Wound healing. Oral diet therapy may be delayed for several days after the injury until the GI tract is motile. Uh, nasal duodenal tube feedings are often started soon after admission. Why? Think about it, guys. This patient, due to the stress of the burns, this patient may have um, gastric ulcers. They may even have paralytic ileus. So we're not going to give them anything by mouth. That patient's going to be NPO until we know they don't. They either don't have these issues or that these issues have been resolved. You're going to encourage patients who can eat solid foods to ingest as many calories as possible. Remember, they're going to be on a high calorie, high protein diet. They need that energy that is found in the calories. Encourage patients to request foods. Look at this, guys. Whenever they feel that they can eat. So we don't care that it's not breakfast, lunch, or dinner. You're hungry, we're feeding you. Okay, so encourage them to request foods whenever they feel they can eat, not just according to the hospital's standard meal schedule. When it comes to these burns, pa burn patients, it could be two o'clock in the morning. They want something to eat, we're giving it to them. All right. Offer frequent, high calorie, high protein supplemental feedings. So even if they want a pepperoni pizza, protein, calories, yeah, give it to them. Keep an accurate calorie count for foods and beverages that are actually ingested by the patient. Maintaining mobility. The patient with a burn injury is expected to maintain or regain an optimal level of mobility because you know what happens. You don't move. You can start to get um, clot formation. You can start to have contractures. We want to avoid all of those complications of immobility. So we need that patient moving as much as possible. Indicators include that the patient has minimal limitations in these actions, muscle movement, joint mobility, walking, and self-positioning. Let's talk about positioning. Positioning is critical, very important. It is critical for patients with burn injuries because the position of comfort for the patient is often one of joint flexion. Well, Professor D, what's so bad about that? Flexion leads to contractual contracture uh, development. So for example, that patient had a burn in their hand, the most, um, the position that would probably be more comfortable for them is them doing this, flexing, right? But that can cause contractures where they can't even open up their fingers anymore. Look what it says. And I put a star next to it so you know it's important. Maintain the patient in a neutral body position with minimal flexion. That means not too much flexion, not too much hyperextension, neutral. That body needs to be neutral, aligned, okay? Maintain good position of the hands, elbows, knees, neck, and axilla. Why? We want to avoid contractures. Range of motion exercises. You wanna do that to maintain mobility. They're performed actively at least three times a day. As far as ambulation is concerned, ambulation is started as soon as possible after fluid shifts have resolved because it maintains mobility. It stops bone density loss. It strengthens the muscles. It stimulates immune function, promotes ventilation, and it prevents many other types of complications. So for ambulation, it has to be performed two to three times a day and progress in length each time. So the first day, the patient may only be able to walk five feet, but we expect it to progress five feet, then six feet, then 10 feet, then 20 feet, then 30 feet. Compression dressings. Compression dressings are applied, look at this guys, after. Not before, because it won't make any sense. The compression dressings are applied after grafts heal, okay? And that helps prevent contractures and tight hypertrophic scars, which can stop mobility. They also inhibit venous stasis and edema in areas with decreased lymph flow. For the best effectiveness, pressure garments must be worn. Look how often, guys. It sucks, but this is for it to be effective. They must be worn at least 23 hours a day every day. There's only 24 hours in the day, guys. 
right? So it looks like the only time they're really taking it off is to get clean. 23 hours a day, every day until scar tissue is mature. And that takes one to two years, 12 to 24 months. Reinforce to the patient and family that wearing pressure garments is beneficial in saving mobility, being able to move around and reducing the scarring. If you don't teach them that, you think they're going to keep that thing on for 23 hours a day, every day for one to two years, you have to tell them why it's important. Supporting positive self-image. Indicators include that the patient should consistently demonstrate these behaviors. Willingness to touch affected body part. Even when uh, the patient just has that burn and you're um, doing the dressing changes, you're still teaching them, okay? They may be in denial at first. They may not even want to look at the wound while you're doing the dressing change. They look away, okay? But we have to get to a point where they're willing to look at that wound. They're willing to learn. Okay, they're willing to uh, touch that affected area because how are they going to learn to change your own dressing if they're not even willing to touch it with gloves, of course. Okay, I'm not going to read all of these. I just put stars next to the ones that tend to show up more on exams, but you guys need to know all of this because I don't write your test. Willingness to use strategies to enhance appearance and function, successful progression through the grieving process. You guys know what the grieving process is. You know, at first, denial, then anger then bargaining, then depression, then acceptance. And it doesn't have to go in that order and the patient goes backwards so they can deny um, the loss of that skin or that tissue, right? And then they get to acceptance and then from acceptance, they go to depression, then they go to bargaining. So um, those are the stages which you have to know those stages, but you need to also understand that they can go back and forth. Okay, the stages are not something that's just progressive. And then once you go to those stages, that's it. Some very often uh, patients will get to the stage of acceptance and then go back to denial. No, this can't be happening to me. So uh, with that, again, successful progression through the grieving process, use of their support system. You're going to assess which stage of grief, I'm right here, guys, which stage of grief the patient's currently experiencing and help interpret his or her behaviors. Are they through the denial phase where they're not even looking at that wound, right? Or are they through the phase where, you know, they're bargaining, God, you know, if, if, if you make this go away, I'll be a nun for the rest of my life. Are they going through the anger phase where they yell at you every time you come in? They're really not upset with you. They're upset with the situation. So you got to figure out which stage of grieving that patient is in and help them explore their feelings about it in a therapeutic manner. Reassure the patient that feelings of grief, loss, anxiety, anger, fear, guilt, all of these are normal. Coordinate with other healthcare team members, such as a psychologist, psychiatrist, a social worker, um, if they're Catholic, a priest, a religious leader, to help address these issues as they come about. Accept the physical and psychological features of the patient. Provide information sessions and counseling for the family to identify patterns of support. Facilitate the patient's use of these systems and the development of new support systems. Make referrals to support groups because guess what? They're not always going to be in your facility. So they have to have um, a form of support outside. And really not only for that patient, but for their support system, because guess what? Right now that patient's angry and they're they may be taking their anger out on you, but who do you think they're gonna take their anger out on when they get back home? So their support system is going to need those referrals as well, okay? Plan and encourage the patient's active participation in care activities. What does it say? Active. Can you safely discharge that patient home if they've been there for weeks and they still refuse to even look at that wound when you try to, when you go in there to change the dressing, how are they going to do it when they get home? 
they're not, and that thing's going to get infected. It's going to turn sepsis, and before you know it, that patient's back in the hospital if they didn't die. So it's very important to help that patient get to the stage where they're actively participating in care activities. Urge families to include the patient in family decision making to the very same degree that he or she participated in the process before the injury. So because they have an injury to the lower leg, did anything happen to their brain? Why are we suddenly not including them in decisions? Many patients have unrealistic expectations of reconstructive surgery and envision an appearance identical or equal in quality to the pre-burn state. So that has to be addressed. Teach the patient and the family about realistic expected cosmetic outcomes. And I think that is it. Guys, that is it for part three of Burns. Let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section. If there's anything that you'd like me to do a lesson on that you're really struggling with, let me know in the comment section. I have a running list going and I promise you I'll get to it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, press that red notification button. I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And you guys can catch me on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Please do not forget to share my content on your social media platform. Thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will see me on the next video.